Live from the Javits Center in New York City, it's theCUBE. Covering Inforum 2017. Brought to you by Infor. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of Inforum. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Dave Vellante. We are joined by Charles Phillips, the, the, the CEO of Infor. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, great to be here, thank you guys for coming. So you're fresh off the keynote, uh, a big deal, thousands of people here in the, at the Javits Center. Um, what would you say is sort of the big, what's most exciting to you about being here and, and what you really want uh, participants, attendees to come away with? Well, there's a lot of energy at the conference and people can see the investments we've been making, all the innovation and just uh, uh, the feedback that we're getting is to keep doing what you're doing. You guys have really changed the industry. Uh, the idea of uh, a network commerce and a network ERP coming together uh, is something new. They like the fact that we kind of find these new areas on our own. Uh, people are buzzing about Coleman, our new AI announcement, that platform as well. So it's been fun getting the feedback. So talk a little bit about Coleman. It has a, talk about the naming of Coleman. Yeah, so it's named after Katherine Coleman Johnson, who was uh, one of the early pioneers in NASA. Uh, she was a researcher, mathematician there to calculate a lot of the orbital fractions that were needed for re-entry. And uh, John Glenn relied on her, and she's in the movie Hidden Figures. Uh, and I uh, got to know that movie pretty well because uh, along with about 30 other African American executives, we raised enough money to send almost 30,000 kids to see the movie for free. We screened it uh, probably three months before it hit the theaters. And uh, a lot of us, so we learned a lot, of, we, had, we didn't know about them ourselves, so we learned a lot about them, and so I was excited to say, if we're going to have an AI platform, why not name it after her, <laughs> such a pioneer. And uh, so it worked out, her family was at the event, and they were just blown away, and, and they were asking, can I get copies of everything, taking pictures with us, so I thought it was a, a highlight of the show. You know, I liked your first slide today and yesterday in the analyst meeting. It basically was your strategy in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, micro verticals was sort of the starting point, the decision to go AWS Cloud, the GT Nexus network component, Burst Analytics, and then Coleman AI. And it's, it's just fit together so nicely and it's, it sounds great. And, and then you also said that, look, cloud and mobile and social, that's table stakes today. It's really a sort of a new, new ball game. So my question is, you know, that the slide's nice, it sounds great. How fully baked is it? Yeah, well, we're, I think we're, you know, we've had some time now, we've on the network, and so we've been working on figuring out the right integration points and where the value add was, and so uh, we're already able to kind of ship uh, things like ASNs directly to our ERP, and, and we showed in context where you can click on an order in M3, for example, and see where it is on an ocean container. So we've already done a lot of that work. And there's only more to come. We want to. Uh, we didn't mention it today. We want to attack the EDI market and commoditize that, yeah. and, and have it be a free service because we already have a network. We can ship packets around and cost us anything. And uh, we do that for some customers today. So we have more that we could have talked about that we didn't get to. So a lot of it's real today. We uh, we also heard at the analyst meeting in, in great depth and a little bit today. Uh, you had the CFO of, of Coke Industries up there, made a large two billion dollar plus in investment. Coke is also a customer. Yeah. Uh, and was a customer prior to the uh, announcement of the investment. How did that all come about? Can you share that sort of story with us? Yeah, so uh, we had had a very successful project at Georgia Pacific. Uh, they brought us in because they were frustrated with SAP. It's too expensive, taking too long. We had the micro vertical features they could get going quickly and we uh, collaborated with them and added a few other things they wanted. So that went very well and kind of word travels when you come in under budget <laughs> inside of Coke. <laughs> and uh, one thing led to another and uh, made a trip to uh, Wichita at their invite and uh, hit it off very well with Charles Coke and he understood what we did. Uh, he's an MIT grad, very technical, so I you know, wasn't sure you know, kind of <laughs> what I was getting into, but once I started talking to him, uh, he clearly understood everything else and uh, the more technical you know, the conversation became, the more animated he got. So I clearly he's kind of our kind of guy. We're product people, <laughs> and so we hit it off very well. And um, they're becoming a, a larger customer. Uh, you're getting deeper and deeper in, into that that account. Uh, but you know, there's an old saying: God created the world in six days, but He didn't have an install base. Yeah. And so, and you guys are have emerged as this really viable alternative to SAP and Oracle. But how do you go from you know where they are to 
this cloud native platform that you guys have developed? Well, it'll be one of the largest global implementations ever of any, of any financial project of any HCM, 130,000 employees, which is great. So a project of that scale, that happens usually top down when they're invested and, and ready to go. So they have four members on our board. Uh, and it's including the CFO, including the, the president of Georgia Pacific, and so many other important executives. And so the guys who run the divisions, many of them are on our board and learning this stuff and excited. So they're actually pushing us right now, which we think is great. We have a weekly cadence call with them with all these senior execs on all the projects, like review where we are, make sure you're getting what you need, are, are people responding? I mean, they are driving. These people know how to execute. And that's, how they're, that's why they're $115 billion. And so uh, it's great for us, great for them. They're pushing us in. Uh, so I'm not too worried about that given what I've seen so far. When you think about the long-term strategy of Infor, you're now one of the most well-funded unicorns uh, along with Uber and Airbnb. Where do you go? I mean, what do you sort of see as sort of the long-term play here? Yeah, post-world domination, then after that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, okay. Uh, we have other industries we want to get into. That's a few acquisitions we probably will consider. We want to expand our network. Uh, these networks grow up like by vertical and by industry. There's a few other verticals we want to get into. Uh, but the list of things that we could build and what people are asking us to build is almost endless, you know? And they like the way we do these kind of digital transformation projects. There's lots of those out there. And so we just want to make sure we have the ecosystem where we can implement. So that's why it's so important to get a sensor and uh, Cap Gemini and Grant Thornton and Deloitte, and uh, they're all taking training as we speak, building out their practices, which we didn't have a year ago. So that was our kind of constraint to scaling. We just couldn't take on so many projects, you know, but now we can. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the structure of the industry, the software industry specifically. I mean, you're fairly famous for having sort of predicted consolidation and then orchestrating that consolidation. Mark Andreessen's you know, famous for saying software is eating the world. I think Benioff said there's going to be more non-tech companies that are SaaS companies than tech companies. Uh, uh, do you expect we'll just see a sort of a deconsolidation of, of, of software or maybe a bifurcation where maybe some of the enterprise guys acquire, but there's all these there's this burgeoning, blooming flowers of software companies emerging. What's your point of view on the software industry and its structure? Uh, I think you'll see more industrial companies wanting to own software. I think you'll see software executives running non-software companies. Uh, most companies think they have to get digital and a lot of the board of directors recognize that and realize they don't have the expertise or domain to do that. And uh, so a lot of software executives get asked to run non-tech companies for that reason because you know, you can learn retail faster than they can learn how to program, <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, and, and if you've been building applications for those verticals, you actually kind of know the, the vertical pretty well. So I think you'll see some integration of some of these domains over time where people have to become more technology affluent. The way to do that is bring in tech people. And the other thing I wanted to ask you, sort of a follow up on that, I mean, you see Amazon buys a Whole Foods and is getting into grocery, they're a content company, Apple's into financial services, and you know it's because of digital, allows you to yeah. sort of jump industry value chains. But for decades, people just stay within their own little value chain silo. Do you see, expect that to change as well, where executives are able to traverse industries? I think so, technology is, a, is causing that, and it's enough disruption and fear where people are willing to consider something completely different than they were before. And uh, that helps us because usually we need someone to either take an action because they see an opportunity or because they're worried about you know, getting disrupted one or the other. That's how these big projects get started. And so that's part of the reason why our growth is so good right now. Hmm. And, and is that what's driving it? Is it the fear of being left behind? It was probably uh, equal amount of both. They see opportunity and I should be doing something but I don't know what, so we have to tell them the what. Or I'm worried about what everybody else is doing. I don't want to get Ubered out and we tell them how not to, to be in that position. And so uh, we're getting an audience at senior levels that we couldn't before just because it's top of mind for everybody. How about, let's talk about M&A a little bit and what you look for in, a, in, a, in an acquisition candidate. Um, uh, you, you have a platform that's you know, very probably dogmatic about it running on that platform, yeah. but talk a little bit more about what you look for. Uh, we usually want next generation thinking and a technical platform that we don't have to completely rewrite because uh, we don't want to kind of pollute our architecture. If it's a modern architecture where we can graft it onto our info OS as we call it, that's fine. Uh, so we don't buy things just for scale. Um, you know, that was kind of an early strategy of the company you know, 10 or 15 years ago. 
We buy things for us that's a specific value proposition for customers or fills a hole that we think we need to fill. Okay. I would rather buy something that is small, maybe not much traction, not much revenue, but a great product, because we have a huge distribution channel and we can grow it pretty quickly. Uh, we can fix all those other problems if, if the product is there. Well, the Burst acquisition, I think, is very interesting because yeah. you saw the ascendancy, we were talking earlier, Rebecca, about, you saw the ascendancy of Tableau and Christian Chabot, very articulate, would talk about the slow BI companies and really depositioning them. Your positioning uh, is actually quite compelling um, not the old takes forever to build a cube, and not the lightweight version of a, just a visualization. You're sort yeah. of the best of both worlds. Uh, um, maybe unpack that a little bit. And that's yeah, and that's, that's the attraction we saw in Burst, is you need some of those enterprise features to understand fragmented and enterprise scale data. That's a hard problem. Uh, having a nice desktop tool that can only handle a single table or gives you conflicting information because you can't have any semantic meaning across different data sources. It's nice to get answers quickly, but if they're wrong, that doesn't help you. you know? so, so we need somebody who could handle the back end. Our customers were asking us to do that. Um, they want us to be the analytic layer, a system of record for analytics because other companies don't want to do that. SAP or Oracle will say, just use all my stuff. I don't want to connect to anybody else. And we know that we have to coexist, and if we can build that analytic later, we think that's strategic high ground, let's own that, and if we can replace some of the underlying systems later, great. You know. Go ahead, Rebecca, I was just please. going to talk about, I was going to switch gears entirely and talk a little bit about politics before the cameras <laughs> were rolling. Okay. Um, you, you were on Obama's Economic Recovery Board, which was led by Paul Volcker. Yeah. You've, you've been <clears> to Washington, <throat> met with Trump, met with uh, Pence. I'd, I'm curious about you, you, how you view the role of business in advising government, uh, yeah. in, in which directions to take, and the, and the approach. I think it's increasingly important in the sense that, uh, especially with the current administration, they res respect business opinion, because um, he's a business guy. Uh, secondly, so many of our institutions, people don't trust anymore, they've kind of lost some of that credibility. I hope we can turn that around, but in the interim, we have to have other people who could fill in for some of that. And, especially tech companies, people want to know what tech companies think, and so I think we almost have a duty to, to try to fill in some of that, and every part of the economy and the government's been affected by technology, they want to understand it, so we can help them do that. And so many of your customers are in fact municipalities and cities and public school systems. Uh, that's a good point. We have 1,500 state and local governments and federal uh, customers, and that's a fast-growing part of our business right now and uh, we're running a lot of federal agencies as we speak because they're going through an upgrade cycle as well. Uh, something called FedRAMP, they have to get certified and they want to move to the cloud and we're doing both of those with them. Now, do you, you also talked about how you see uh, technology executives m perhaps moving into other industries. Do you see them also moving into public service? Do you see that as a possibility? That's going to take longer, it's probably later in their careers because <laughs> of the economics of that. Uh, but every now and then you'll see one do it, yeah. So a question on, on, on cloud, it was almost by necessity, uh, I would argue, that you sort of gravitated toward AWS, smart move. Others have said, you know, Oracle in particular, we're going to own the whole stack, and we can make a lot of money owning the whole, mm -hmm. whole stack. If you had to do it again, would you pursue that same strategy and why? Well, um, when we got there, the company was just starting, trying to build a cloud business. We were doing a traditional, trying to own data centers and uh, you know, kind of do data center sharing. We could have done that and continue with that over time, but I just thought it wouldn't provide the elastic compute and the scale of data management that I thought was coming. Uh, we looked at all the platforms that were out there at the time. We met with Microsoft, IBM, you name it, and at the time, uh, AWS was just so much further along in terms of services available, capabilities, entrepreneurial spirit, scale, it, just, it wasn't even close, you know, in our minds, anyway. And so, uh, they were great partners to work with, and for us, it's been the right decision, and they've, they've helped us a lot. Yeah, and, and showing, seeing your archives may be a question, but you're pretty technical, maybe a better question for Duncan or mm -hmm. Soma, but I'll ask you, because you're more technical than I am. When you look at the, your architecture slides, mm -hmm. there's a lot of Amazon in there. There's, there it looks is, like yeah. there's DynamoDB, it looks like some Kinesis, yep. uh, there's S3, there's all kinds of flywheel oriented tech. Yep. Um, I wonder if you could sort of elaborate on that in terms of the impact that that has, not only on you, but ultimately on your customers. 
Yeah, I know, that was by design, by my direction. I wanted to just take advantage of every single service we could on AWS, because every time we do that, that's less work for my developers. I don't want them worried about infrastructure, just write the application, be an industry expert. So anytime they come up with a new service, uh, you name it, whether it's a VPN or archiving, backup, uh, uh, we were one of the early customers of Redshift, we take advantage of it because that's, that's cheaper for us to do it that way and we get the scale that we need and we get it in multiple countries. So anything other strategy than that, we have to replicate things in multiple places and we have to figure out how to make it work on AWS. And, and I know we're limited on time, but if, if software's eating the world, software's going to eat the edge. Yeah. So talk about your edge strategy. Uh, well, it depends on what you mean by edge strategy. I think the software eating the world is true. Um, I'm, Maybe it's helping the world, <laughs> as it might be a better way to put it, but almost every product that we see, it's inside of now. And so that's actually good for us, being the largest vendor for uh, asset management. Every IOT company is coming to us because all that data is meaningless unless you can generate a work order or a requisition and get something fixed, schedule someone to come. That's what we do. So all of that data needs to end up in a repository that can affect a business process, and we own that business process. You know? Well, something that we've said in theCUBE from the early days of so-called big data is the practitioners of big data are the guys who are going to really do well. It's not yeah. necessarily the guys selling big data infrastructure, and, and that's proving true. I mean, you guys never talked ever, I don't think, about big data, but you're a data company now, yeah. first. Yeah, well, and we collected a lot more data than we ever, we ever thought we would, and so now we got to figure out kind of how to how use to parse that. It, how to use it, exactly. <laughs> so, which is why we added the next two layers of that stack, right? So, that'll be next year's summit. Yeah, next exactly. Year's <laughs> <laughs> well, Charles Phillips, thanks so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. Great, thanks guys, appreciate Good it. See you, thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. We will have more from theCUBE's coverage of Inforum after this.